Hopefully we're good now. So before we get started, if we want to avoid the overhead of pulling up the notebooks, uh, if you go ahead and go to the page, you can pull up the first notebook, notebook A, and just run the first box that just does the pulling the packages for TBM. That's if you want to follow along. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Eddie. Sorry for being the roadblock between the break. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some practical use cases we have in AutoTVM for researchers and developers. And this will be focusing on writing schedules, templates, and tuning your operators in AutoTVM. So quickly I just want to ask, how many people have written an operator in TVM before? Okay, so that's, that's all right. So we may spend a little more time than I allotted for on the first parts of the tutorial, and I'll kind of quickly go through the second parts just so that people can get a taste for what everything looks like. And as Jared mentioned, you could, you're always free to go back to the notebooks because they're very self-contained and explore everything in depth, uh, step by step. So first, I'll talk about some of the TVM components that are relevant to auto TVM, and essentially just the terminology that we use to describe everything. So first, we have this notion of a kernel, which you can think of as just one implementation for a tensor operator, like a matrix multiplier or convolution. And here, the kernel we show is something like, like a direct convolution. And the reason it's called, we say direct in front of the convolution is direct here denotes the strategy. So just like for problems like sorting, you have different strategies for implementation. For com things like convolution, you have different strategies for the implementation. So for this strategy, it's accompanied by a declaration, which describes how to do the computation, and also some fixed schedule, which tells you how to order the operations or how to orchestrate things like memory access and so on in your computation. And this fixed schedule comes with a bag of fixed parameters that describe things like loop tilings, loop axes orderings, and so on. Moving on from this single kernel view, we can think of a generalized schedule template that just specifies the strategy that you want to implement your operator with, but leaves the low-level details like loop tilings and reorderings free as choices to be filled in by an auto-tuner. And so you can imagine that for deep learning workloads that we want to support, there's a wide variety of operators to implement, and also each of these operators may have several different strategies we can use for different hardware devices. So TVM has an operator inventory called Topi, which provides you a library of templates that implements these strategies. So there's just a handful that I've shown below, some things like into style style convolution, spatial packing, matrix multiply, Winograd convolutions, and so on. So with this view of kind of the components that are important to auto TVM, I'll talk about how these components fit into the layers that are relevant here. And this is just a simple diagram showing one view of your computation that you might want to do and optimize for using auto TVM. So if you have something like your neural network here, in this case it's a fairly generic style of vision model, you might have a bunch of convolution layers stacked on top of each other with batch forms and relus in between, followed by a dense layer and then a soft max. In reality, when you actually want to execute this model, each of the operators are backed by some low-level kernel code. And even though the first four layers are all convolutions here, they will all have different, they may have different shapes, for example, or different properties that may change the strategy that you want to use to execute them. So when we actually want to execute each of these convolutions, the first one might go to an image to call style convolution. We might use Winograd for some of the other ones, and then finally a, a direct for COMP2 here. And similarly, operators like dense may also be backed by a specific strategy. And beneath each of these strategies, as, we, as I talked on the previous slide, uh, there's a declaration, declaration that specifies how this computation is done, and also a template that specifies a search space of parameters that you may want to choose to fine tune the strategy for your exact operator and your network and your hardware that you want to run on. Okay, so kind of with that big picture or high level overview, I'll be presenting the tutorial in three notebooks in essentially three parts. The first part will be kind of the, your first steps in TVM of declaring and scheduling an operator. And then we'll move on to 
declaring, uh, sorry, defining and lifting the operator we just declared to a schedule template to just essentially extract the strategy with which we want to implement the operator. And finally, I'll show how you can tune an entire model end-to-end -end with TVM's existing collection of schedule templates uh, in the operator library token. So while we transition to the notebooks, uh, uh, we can pause for a second if there's any questions. Okay, good. So uh, for those who missed the, this part, the links are all in the schedule here. And I've already run the first box here, which is kind of just doing the housekeeping of pulling in the packages. And in this first notebook, we're just going to, okay, hopefully that, I don't need. So the first the first notebook is just looking at writing a convolution on the CPU. So the focus here is not really to get you know the maximum possible performance on a CPU, but it's to instead show some of the basic optimizations you can do in TVM to set the stage for things like writing templates and so on. And so here, what we're going to do after importing the kind of just the necessarily pack, necessary packages we need to run the tutorial is we're going to define the shape of the convolution that we're going to implement. And here, this is just some fairly generic stuff, like we specified the number of input and output channels, the height and width, and, and so on. And from the shape uh, of these, these parameters, we can explicitly define the input, weight, and output shape of the computation. So with that in mind, we can go ahead and just allocate uh, TVM placeholders for each of the pieces of pieces of data and memory that we will do the computation on. And in addition to allocating these memory objects, uh, we also want to specify the reduction axes of the convolution. So you know, if you recall, convolution, in this case 2D, is operating over three reduction axes, the uh, vertical dimension, the horizontal dimension, and also across the channels. So with these axes defined, we then define the computation by first specifying the output shape with this tuple here. And then we do uh, this style where we give a lambda function that specifies how to compute the output at each of these indices, output y, output x, and output channel. And the way you do the computation is just by doing the summation over the reduction axes uh, by multiplying the input and weights at those corresponding positions. So any questions up to this point? Okay. So with that, we can go ahead and generate the d default schedule. Uh, you've seen this on previous slides as the vanilla schedule. So after you define the convolution, uh, TVM, or, and you, after you define the computation rather, uh, TVM will give you the vanilla loop nest with no optimizations applied just so uh, you have a sense of this is what you're going to manipulate to perform further optimizations. So you can see it's exactly as we expressed, it's computing the output over each of the axes, and for at each position, it's first uh, initializing the, comp the output, and then doing the reduction to, to set the value. So just so we have a quick baseline number for what, how long this takes on this piece of hardware, we can go ahead and compile the function with TVM build, create uh, or instantiate a time evaluator that times this function as it runs, allocate some data, uh, sorry, yes, allocate some data and initialize it with NumPy, and then we can go ahead and just run and time this function. Yeah, so we can see that currently on this CoLab instance, it takes about 150 milliseconds to run this uh, fairly st standard convolution. It's, I think it's one of the layers in Resin 18. So next, we can begin to take a look at some of the schedule transformations we can apply here. And the way we would uh, apply the schedule transformations is by manipulating the computation that we define here. So one of the things we can do is extract the loop axes out of the computation with comp.off.axis, or similarly, reduce axis for the loop axes corresponding to the reduction. And we can go ahead and just apply a reorder to reorder the loop axes. And then I'll go ahead and just print what this, the schedule looks like in this, after we've done this transformation and the timing result afterwards. So you can see that after we've reordered the loop axes, the two of the reduction axes have moved to the outside and one is kind of still uh, in between one of the output uh, indice axes. Uh, 
And one other thing to observe is TVM kind of handle uh, TVM kind of handles all of, and manages all of the uh, additional housekeeping that you need to do for this kind of a transformation. One of the things you'll notice is that the initialization for zeroing things out has now moved above because we've changed where the reduction axes uh, appear. And so you can see after this reordering, uh, we've gone from about 150 milliseconds to four milliseconds. And so you know this is a very classic illustration of how changing your order of operations has benefits depending on the memory hierarchy of your device. And so another schedule transformation that we can go over quickly is vectorization. So as we've already extracted the CO loop uh, from the computation, we can go ahead and call vectorize it, uh, call vectorize on it. And you can see that before we had this four output channel loop in the schedule. And now that's been essentially removed and replaced with a ramp, which is providing a hint to vectorize the computation there. Uh, one, one thing you'll notice though is that the performance is not really as much as we would, there's not as much of a performance gain as we would expect from doing vectorization. And this is just a taste of the fact that when you want to combine multiple schedule transformations or optimizations together, it's a very difficult problem because you can imagine we chose a good reordering for performance, but potentially it was not the best loop reordering if we wanted to also do vectorization. So when you want to compose multiple optimizations together, it's a very tricky problem to balance all of these competing uh, optimizations. And this kind of leads into what we'll talk about next with schedule templates and auto-tuning and so on. So kind of in conclusion, we kind of just introduce how to declare an operator in TVM, and that gives you the default of vanilla implementation, and then you can begin playing around with schedule transformations to change the performance. In this case, you know, we can see that reordering helped, but because of, as a consequence of the particular reordering we chose, maybe that limited the effect of vectorization on the code. So I'll open the next notebook, uh, and we can, if there's any questions in the meantime, we can also take those. Uh, one thing, if you want to follow this next notebook uh, along, make sure that the runtime type includes GPU under the hardware accelerator because we're actually gonna use the GPU in this case. Okay, so I'll just keep going um, and let this run. Yes. Right. Yes, I mean, that's, that's, that's a very natural extension. So the question is like, you know, we have these different variants of convolution, for example. Do, how do we choose between direct, winter grad, or so on? Generally, the space of strategies is not very large yet. So even doing something like exhaustively trying different strategies is okay. In practice, there are fairly good heuristics for when different strategies will be good. For example, like it's very popular to use three by three convolutions and use winter grad with those. Uh, but yes, it's definitely, it's a composable, it's composable in that way. Okay, so this is fairly similar to the first notebook. Uh, the, the, the difference from this notebook, this difference between this notebook and the first one is that instead of running on the CPU, we're gonna run on the GPU, and we're gonna go ahead and skip uh, the initial step of manually defining the uh, convolution operator here. So instead, we're going to just specify the shape of our computation directly in kind of the you know batch height width channel output channel in style, and uh, again allocate TVM placeholders. But instead, here you'll notice that instead of saying you know this is TVM compute with uh, and manually specifying you know this is how you do the reduction, TVM provides many popular declarations out of the box. So we're just going to use one from our library, and Similar to the previous case, we will see that this gives us a default schedule. Uh, this is a more general version of convolution, so there's a few more details here, like this padding step here, which is just saying uh, that for convolutions where you want to pad the input, there's this additional stage where you produce this uh, slightly modified version of the input before you go ahead and do the computation. And then here you can see it's following the same pattern of kind of output channels, output height, output width, and then the reduction. Uh, one of the first things that we'll do in the schedule transformation is just go ahead and inline the padding computation. Uh, and then in TVM, you can just do this by calling compute inline on the pad data computation. 
And then the next few things we'll define are uh, kind of uh, general patterns, but this is more specific to in NVIDIA GPU is we'll define many of these cache read and one of these cache write stages. And so these are essentially just telling the compiler to produce intermediate memory uh, arrays so that uh, we can leverage the memory hierarchy of the GPU more effectively. So some of these are allocated in shared memory on the GPU, and some of these are given the local scope, which just refers to registers on the GPU. So you can see that after we've kind of done these de declarations, um, the padding computation has been removed, but we do now do see these additional produce uh, dot shared and dot shared dot local stages for the things that we want to, uh, that we, for the cache reads and cache writes that we just added. And then all the way at the bottom, you'll see that there's this compute that local that's still there. So the next thing that we're going to look at is how we do tiling over loop axes. So I think we've seen a few examples of these on the previous slides. I'll just quickly go over this. So first we just define a bunch of tiling factors for uh, the output channels, uh, the output X and output Y. And this is just saying that for the output channel loop, we want to partition it into four loops, uh, a loop nest with four loops with these factors. And we'll do the same for the X and Y loop. So this is just splitting a big loop over the channels uh, many times uh, by a factor of eight each time and similarly for the output X and output Y. And if it's not clear uh, what I mean by that, it should be apparent after we call the split and you can see what the loop nest looks like after this. And after we've kind of uh, manipulated the default loop nest in this way, we now get many additional loop axes. So every time we do a split, it changes one axis into two. So every time we call a split, we get two as an output, even though we pass one as an, out, uh, as an input. And after we kind of get all of the loop axes we want, we can go ahead and reorder everything that we've produced so far. So you can see that the uh, cache reads and writes are still there because we haven't touched those yet. But beneath this, uh, there's the, in the compute set, we now have, you know, outer and inner, inner, outer, for example, over, over uh, the different loops that have been split. And you can see that uh, now these have factors like eight, seven, and seven that correspond to uh, the, the splits that we've allocated so far. Okay, so the next step is kind of the, one of the most important ones when it comes to programming on a GPU, and that's mapping loop indices or loop axes to the GPU parallel programming style, which is the pieces that are blocks, uh, threads, and in TVM's case, we also introduce virtual threads, which are kind of threads implemented in software just so we can get more flexibility in further reshaping the computation pattern or the ordering of the operations on the GPU. So the important thing to see here is after we do this bind step, all of the, uh, many of the loop axes for the computation have disappeared because they've been bound for the blocks and threads instead. And an additional uh, thing to note is we also declared where to compute the, uh, the one of the cache stages. And so that has now been moved. Uh, you can see that now inside the computation, there's now this produce compute dot local, which has, which says where we want to produce this particular cache stage. And here, this is more of the same. We basically just specify some factors that we want to apply to tile over the reduction instead. And we, this is, uh, I'll just press play here because it's exactly the same transformation that we've done before, but over the redu reduction axes. And after we have the full uh, axes, in addition to the reduction ones that we've just created, we can now reorder everything completely and then define where we want to do the cache stages for the shared memory and the local memory pieces of the GPU. So you can see that now everything has been moved inside uh, the produce compute stage. All of the uh, cache parts are now done at some part of the loops in the computation here. 
And so one key thing to notice is like every single time that I've done so far uh, these splits defined based on factors, there's been some magic numbers that are just appearing of I'm saying this is what I want to split by, but it, there's no good indication of how I should make these cho choices. And then finally, some additional housekeeping is just we need to uh, prepare the shared memory loads for the GPU because on a GPU, one of the idiosyncrasies is the shared memory is a scratch pad that is programmer managed. So here we just schedule those. Uh, there was, those details are not super important for this tutorial, but it's just something that we have to do on the GPU. Okay, and then finally, after everything we've seen so far, we now have code that has been scheduled and bound so it can run on the GPU. So we're gonna go ahead and call a reference Python implementation just to check the results, and then create, and, uh, create a target to compile our code for, and then do ver something very similar to what we did for the CPU example, which is just to call the function from within the Python environment. Here we're also going to uh, print how many operations uh, this took so we can compute the, the G-flops or the uh, floating point operations per second we achieved on the GPU. Okay, so we can see that in this case, it took about a millisecond to run, and we got about 240 uh, G-flops or so with this kind of manually scheduled version of convolution. So next I'll move quickly to how we can lift this manual schedule into a template that just kind of defines the strategy that we use here, which is just direct convolution. And so the template de definition, which I'll just run ahead of time, looks very similar to what we did. It does exactly the same loop transformations in, in terms of you know, how we reorder things and how many times we split things. But if you notice, instead of manually giving four numbers like 8881, we now leave the, the splitting and tiling factors uh, as defined by the auto-tuner. So with the, all these config.define-split calls here, that's what we're doing. We're saying we want to take this loop and split it four times. And we, take, we do the same thing with the direction loops and split it three times. So all of the, the huge pile of code that was you know, manually splitting everything each time and coming up with magic numbers for the factors has been removed. And we can also do things like uh, auto-tune or define tunable knobs for parameters like whether or not to unroll and so on in, when we do the compilation. And so, yeah, this is exactly what we've seen before. We still do the same binds of loops of threads, but all of the kind of magic number details are now left to the auto-tuner to decide. Okay, so in Tanji's talk, we, we uh, I think we briefly covered the fleet, our auto-TVM fleet infrastructure, and so a quick summary of that is that just that TVM provides a distributed runtime uh, that allows you to use devices that you have available and, and multiplex them across different tuning jobs that you may have. So we're gonna leverage this here by first starting uh, a tracker that tracks what GPUs we have available and we're gonna add just a single GPU device to our tracker that's tied to this CoLab notebook and we're gonna use that to do the auto tuning here. So what will happen is um, the auto tuner will try different possible choices for each of the parameters we defined in the schedule template. And using a statistical cost model, we will narrow down on what choices we want to try out next and repeat the tuning loop where we then strip off another batch of things to try out and refine our statistical cost model and so on. And so this is this kind of boilerplate that I will elide for now on how to choose specific auto-tuning parameters, like how long we want to spend tuning and so on, and how we want to manage the features. But after kicking off uh, the tuning job, we can go ahead and plot the performance over time and see what we achieve. And as you can see, after about trying 25 different configurations on the GPU, it's already you know, gotten much faster than what we've achieved in our manually kind of magic number style schedule just because it has the freedom to try many, many things out exhaustively and refine that search with the cost model. So right now I think it's uh, about 600 GFLOPs or so and it's gonna continue tuning. So while this is still chugging, 
Uh, before I go to the last notebook, I'm uh, also free to take questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, that would be right here, yes. Okay, so this is like saying we tape in, we take in a loop axis, in this case F. F is corresponding to the, the output channel loop for the, con uh, the convolution. It's just, this is saying we want to split that into a loop nest that's four deep. Yes, yes, so that, that's right in the sense that uh, this is also kind of a tunable knob depending on your algorithm. In this case, for GPUs at least, it's a little more flexible than that because you can imagine one of the factors here can just be chosen to be one, for example. In that case, that also includes you know, num outputs three, num outputs two, and num outputs one because if you have a loop with just the extent one, that kind of goes away when you do the comp compilation. But you are right in the sense that this is part of the strategy and then in that sense, the strategy can also be tuned. Okay, so you know we can let this run indefinitely, but I'll move on to the next notebook. Um, and so, right. So hierarchical tuning is definitely possible. We may not necessarily want to you know reuse the exact same style because. The, auto, the innermost auto TVM tuning loop is kind of optimized just for a particular uh, set of system constraints. So what I mean by that is you can imagine every single time we shift off a kernel to run on the GPU to measure the performance, that kernel runs very fast, right? But then if you ask the question of how good is this strategy, you, can, you probably cannot get an answer back as quickly as how good is this particular configuration. So in that sense, like the hierarchical tuning is definitely possible. We probably want to use a different strategy than the statistical cost model that we have so far. So yeah, the same, the same thing uh, for the third notebook, which is just to make sure that the runtime is on the GPU if you want to follow along. But I'll go through this fairly quickly because most of the pieces here are not super interesting from a code perspective. They're just to give people a taste of uh, what is possible when you want to tune your own model. So these are the similar steps as before. We start a tracker to track our resources. We start a server that manages our single CoLab GPU in this case. Uh, we check that things are available. Uh, this is some more boiler, boilerplate for importing. And then now, as Jared has shown before, we have a wide variety of front ends and also in-house predefined testing models that you can use to import your model and in this case, this get network uh, function is just boilerplate to do that. Now we set more tuning options here. And these again define things like which statistical cost model we want to use, what features we want to use, and how long we want to run the tuning for. And these are kind of parameters that we chose to play nicely with CoLab's kind of CPU constraints and so on. So if you want to run this yourself, we highly recommend using dedicated hardware and using the parameters in the TVM Sphinx Gallery tutorial because those are much more suitable for when you have more hardware resources to do things on. So after uh, we define our model, I'll just briefly go over what happens here in the tuning process. So we create a log file to track all of the different configurations that the auto tuner has explored along the way. And this is just so that at the end of the tuning process, we can coalesce everything into one log file that just has the best version of everything. And uh, the tuner here just populate, just we have a few different choices here. You can use a black box style genetic algorithm, you can use a statistical cost model, or do grid search or any technique uh, that's supported here. Finally, the actual tuning process first takes in your network and extracts the tasks in it. So for something like a resin 18, there's many convolutions and it will extract every unique convolution, for example, as a candidate for tuning or to choose the best schedule for. And after, we, we probably won't get to the last step here, which is actually uh, exporting and evaluate, but as part of a bonus to this tuning process, the script will also 
after the tuning is completed, load all the best configurations, and finally profile the end-to-end -end network execution time after all of the intermediate operators have been tuned. So in this case, we're just tuning a Resin 18. And at the bottom here, you can see that the tasks have been extracted and there's 12 tasks. That just means that even though there's 18 convolutional layers in ResNet, there's really only about 12 unique operators that we want to tune for. And so for each operator, the tuning will go ahead and try configurations. And so what's printed here is like the performance of the conf configuration that was tried and the best one that was seen so far. Uh, and any questions at this point? I think uh, this is pretty much the, the conclusion. We can just you know let this run. I'll take questions. Yeah, people are eager for the break. 